out with Salman Rushdie. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Salman Rushdie is and don't know the history here, Salman Rushdie is a uh, well-known author, best-selling author. He's, uh, he's one of the most famous, probably, novel writers of, uh, of the late 20th, early 21st century. Uh, he, uh, he published his first novel that was a big success in 1981. And in 19, uh, 1988, uh, he published a novel uh, called Satanic Verses. Uh, the novel uh, imagines a, a modernized Muhammad. It is, uh, you know, presents a certain view of Islam uh, and that many Muslims have found offensive. Indeed, uh, Salman Rushdie, who was born in India uh, to, a, uh, to a, a, a secular Muslim family and, you know, I think has stated that he himself is an atheist, but grew up, grew up secular, but, but from a Muslim background. Uh, it, uh, the book was first banned in India, of all places, and then abandoned in, in almost all uh, Muslim countries. Uh, in 1989, the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, the supreme leader, of Iran issued a fatwa. A fatwa is a declaration of law, um, declaring, basically putting a price on the head of Solomon Rushdie, declaring it a, um, a, um, uh, you know, declaring him a, uh, an apostle, uh, an enemy of Islam, uh, and uh, and putting a price, I think it was three million dollars, three million dollars uh, on his head. Uh, what's interesting is the fatwa. This uh, this uh, has never been rescinded. Uh, the supreme leader of Iran, the current supreme leader of Iran, it's a different supreme leader, has not rescinded uh, has not rescinded that. Um, and um, apostate, not apostle. Thank you, apostate, an infidel. An apostate. Apostate is worse. Somebody who's born Muslim and who turns against the religion is the worst for them. Uh, indeed, a, a foundation that is linked to the authorities in Iran, that's linked to the, to the administration, even though so-called the government has distanced itself from the fatwa. Fatwa has never been rescinded. And um, since then, it's been uh, increased. Uh, a, a foundation, an Iranian foundation has increased the fatwa by half a million dollars, it's, I think it stands right now, three and a half million dollars uh, for anybody who kills uh, uh, Solomon Rushdie. Uh, you know, this is, while well, uh, this fatwa was author, was uh, delivered by a Shiite authority and by the Shiite government, uh, you know, supreme leader of Iran, uh, this is a fatwa that was picked up uh, by uh, Sunni Muslims as well. Uh, it was a fatwa. It was a fatwa that was uh, that has animated many Muslims uh, for a very long time. Uh, you know, a little bit of a history. When when this fatwa came out in 1989, it not only put a price on the head of Salman Rushdie, but it also basically was a death warrant in a sense to anybody who had anything to do with this book. So publishers all over the world, translators. Um, and, uh, and anybody who, who publicized the book, advertised the book, tried to sell the book, booksellers, and so on. Even in New York, the uh, publisher of uh, Salman Rushdie's, uh, Eng uh, Engl uh, trans I guess, American uh, publication of uh, the Satanic Verses, uh, was sent threatening letters, uh, letters to threaten the lives of the publisher. And, and uh, a couple of bookstores in, uh, in New York, if I remember right, were firebombed. Uh, because in their front windows they carried a version of the Satanic Verses. At the time, uh, George Bush Sr. was president, and uh, the response of, um, of uh, George Bush was basically to do nothing. Um, John reminds me, but yes, the, 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 I'll just, just give you a little bit more background. The Japanese translator of the satanic verses was um, was murdered, um, knife stabbing again because of his association uh, with that. And uh, let me just see. I thought there was one other event that I wanted to highlight. Um, yeah. So and and uh, again, publishers have been um, have been uh, have been um, uh, threatened. The Norwegian publisher uh, was shot 
and seriously wounded in the early 1990s. So uh, the Japanese translator was stabbed to death also in the early 1990s. So uh, this is not theoretical. This is not uh, just, just, you know, uh, you know, somebody says, yeah, you should die. No, this uh, Muslims all over the world took this seriously. Um, Salman Rushdie itself, himself has been attacked in the past. For nine years, he went basically into hiding, uh, non-disclosed, did no public events, uh, was hidden away probably somewhere in the UK. Uh, he's, a re he's a citizen both of the UK and the United States today. But I was, I, was, I was saying that the Bush administration at the time basically did nothing. It, uh, it you know, uh, it ignored the fatwa, basically said something to the effect of, and this, this is true of the Muslim cartoons later on, the, the Bush Jr. said the same thing, basically said something to the extent of, yeah, you really shouldn't insult religion. It really isn't a good thing. We, 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 we protect free speech and we believe in free speech, but you really shouldn't do it. I mean, you really shouldn't offend uh, religion. It's, 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 it's not nice. This is, this is the, the, the Bush administration, right? Tough, uh, 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 the tough Bush administration. Uh, at the time, the Ayn Rand Institute and Leonard Peikoff uh, put out a four-page ad, I think in the New York Times, four-page ad denouncing the Bush administration, uh, basically viewing this as, uh, viewing the attitude as a betrayal of the First Amendment. The First Amendment, I believe, uh, requires demands of the government to, to protect us from threats against our speech, from violence against us. In a sense, uh, by threatening the uh, the book publisher, the American book publisher, put aside at the time, I don't think Solomon Rushdie was an American citizen, but the book publisher certainly was, is basically an act of war by the Iranian government. The Iranian government threatened, threatened uh, U.S. citizens. It threatened... American citizens, uh, and uh, and as such, it, it it that in and of itself was an act of war. The the, the Leonard Peikoff at the time um, said that you know the United States was cowardly and was defaulting on its responsibility uh, to protect uh, to protect the First Amendment. Um, okay, it's it. Uh, Mark says the New York State Trooper just said the name of the stalker is Hadi Matar. Uh, Matar, uh, very likely Muslim. Uh, it, you know, it would be interesting if he's Iranian or just just Muslim more broadly. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'd be interested. I'd be interested in knowing what the relationship there, uh, what the relationship there actually is. Um, so, um, oops, I don't want to shut that window. It's difficult to do these shows on a laptop. There's just so much going on in the screen. Is um, yeah, but 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 notice this: that uh, state the, the trooper also said there's no indication of a motive at this time. Um, Rusty is still in surgery. That's not a good sign that it's still in surgery. The, okay, so Hadi Matau, um, how to tell uh, what kind of a name that is? Maybe somebody can Google the name and see if the, if there's any indication of the origins. But no indication of a motive at this time. I mean, really? The guy didn't provide you with a motive? Didn't say why he did it? I'd, I'd be surprised. Um, so Rushdie has been in hiding, uh, but about nine, about, you know, so that was, uh, he hid basically from 1989 until the late 1990s. And then he came out of hiding and he said, look, I, I'm not willing to live in fear. Uh, I mean, he, was, he took a very courageous position. He said, I'm not willing to live in fear. I'm going to live my life normally. I'm going to do public events. I'm going to continue to write books. I'm going to continue to live. And I won't let these people cower me. And he continued. And he continued to speak out against uh, the violent Islamists. He, he, he was outspoken after 9-11. Um, I've got this uh, you know, quote from him about free speech. He says, nobody has a right to not be offended. The right doesn't exist in any declaration I, I've ever read. If you're offended, it is your problem. That's Salman Rushdie, and I, I agree completely, obviously. Um, so, uh, you know, Rushdie has, uh, in the early days, I think, in the 2000s, particularly after 9-11, and particularly 
uh, when the Danish cartoons came out and Charlie Hebdo was attacked and there was a lot of violence against people who spoke up against Islam, which they used to show up in public events with significant security. But I'd say the last 10 years or so, um, maybe less, he's dropped the security. And at this event um, in, uh, in, I think it's upstate New York, uh, he had no security. I mean, there was one security guard there, just a kind of a regular a public event security guard. I don't think there was a security detail assigned to him. I don't think there were any particular security measures taken at the event. I, I doubt bags were checked and things like that. Um, metal detectors, things like that. Uh, and uh, it looks like he was seated, being interviewed uh, by the host. Uh, and this guy just jumped out. He, he had something over his face. I don't know why he was trying to hide his face because he was going to get caught. But he jumped up from his seat, ran onto the stage before anybody could stop him and just started stabbing at Rushdie. Um, he, got, he got a number of stab wounds uh, to the neck, which is, which is pretty bad, um, uh, you know, depending on how deep it went. And, he, he, you know, the assumption is he's lost a lot of blood. Uh, but he's been in surgery for a long time, so there must have been some real damage done there. Also to the chest, um, so it does, you know, while he was alive, breathing, he had a pulse when he was put on the helicopter and flown, uh, to the hospital. Um, you know, I, I, let's hope all we can do, I guess is hope, uh, that, uh, that he will survive this and survive it whole, um, without any permanent damage. Uh, but, but truly horrific, a horrific attack by what appears to be somebody fulfilling the fatwa, living up to the fatwa. Um, and, uh, and acting on it, you know, this has been a, a, a real problem with Islamism, uh, for the last, you know, since 1989, uh, the thing is that they think they can get away with it, right? They, they, uh, they think they can get away with it. We see it over and over and over again. Salman Rushdie was really only the beginning, but you saw it when the Danish cartoons came out, um, and why do I say I th they think they can get away with it? Because the Muslim world went crazy. They burnt buildings. They, they, they killed people. They, they destroyed property all, all over the world, particularly in their own countries, but all over the world. Uh, they threatened uh, the cartoonists. Some of the cartoonists have actually been attacked. Um, and most, almost all, no American newspapers would show the Danish cartoons. Uh, and the Danish cartoons were condemned. Again, George Bush Jr. said he shouldn't offend religion. He wishes they hadn't done it. It really isn't appropriate. Uh, you know, so, so in a sense taking, but, you know, but violence is inappropriate and so on. So weak, oh God, so weak, so pathetic, so ridiculous. And as a consequence, I think they continue, the Muslims continue to be, the Islamists continue to be emboldened uh you know for years the 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 uh the publisher of the danish cartoon uh would travel with massive security with significant security um uh, to protect him i think he's dropped in the last few years the security maybe now with the stabbing of solomon rushdie he'll bring security back um but it it really is uh uh it's been horrific. And then, of course, um, and then, of course, uh, you got the, uh, you got the, the in, in 2015, which is not that long ago, you got the murder of the cartoonists in uh, Charlie Hebdo again, because they did to, uh, uh, to draw cartoons of the, uh, of the, um, you know, of the, uh, of Muhammad. So, um, What has the West done as a response? Nothing. Coward. Right? So uh, I remember when Charlie Hebdo happened and millions of people went out in the streets in uh, Paris and uh, uh, was it? I am Charlie Hebdo. They all, you know, had this chant, I am Charlie Hebdo. Uh, and they made a big deal out of uh, them being Charlie Hebdo. Um, how many of them published the cartoons on their Twitter and their Facebook pages? Almost nobody. How many uh, American magazines and newspapers that put out Je suis 
Charlie Hebdo. How many of them published the cartoons that got the cartoonist and Charlie Hebdo murdered? None of them. How many actually supported the way to offend Muslims? Almost nobody. And have any Western governments come out forcefully in protecting our right to offend Islam? No. No. So, we basically send a message to the Muslim world that we will be coward, that their religion is beyond criticism, that we are willing to let them rampage, let them kill, let them murder, let them threaten, let them firebomb, let them jump on stages and stab people. And yeah, we'll, we'll punish the perpetrator, the direct perpetrator, the immediate perpetrator, but we're not going to inflict any, any significant cost. We're not going to blame any beyond the, the particular specific individual. We're not going to defend ourselves against states that promote this kind of terrorism, states that promote this kind of barbarism, states that actually encourage it by giving rewards to people who are engaged in this violence. And I was the United States as leader of the West and the rest of the Western world has encouraged the perpetuation of this idea that offending Muslims is wrong, that offending Islam is punishable, and that it's okay, or at least, not okay, but at least we're not going to get too upset with Muslims who try to, who try to, you know, raise up arms to so-called defend their prophet. Um, so anyway, uh, it's a real tragedy. It's a tragedy that was to be expected. It's a tragedy in a sense that um, Leonard Peikoff in 1989 saw coming. It's a tragedy that could have been avoided. It's a tragedy that I think brings to the forefront the, you know, just the pathetic, the, uh, the uh, unprincipled, nature of, uh, of, of the American government and its willingness and ability to protect the individual rights of Americans. Uh, you know, what should have America done? I mean, basically it should have said to the Iranians in 1989, now remember, in my view, Iran was at war with the United States in 1989. It had gone to war in 1979 when they took the American embassy, that's an act of war. They spent the 1980s killing Americans. They killed 244 Marines in Beirut in 1983. They then kidnapped Americans all over the Middle East and killed them during the 1980s. Iran was in a state of war with the United States, but America pretended like nothing was going on, that there was no problem, there was no issue. What should have happened is the United States should have told the Iranians, you have 48 hours to um, to rescind this fatwa, um, you will not threaten the lives. You will not threaten the property of American citizens. And if you do, um, you know you will be destroyed. And um, uh, you know if if they hadn't, then uh, you 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 bomb the hell out of the the residency of uh, of Khomeini. I'm a big supporter of. Um, you know, there's, there's this attitude that you don't go for the heads of state. You don't kill heads of state. You don't, I mean, I would have gone after the Supreme Leader, tried to kill him. I would have destroyed the entire religious infrastructure of Iran. There's, there's a, a whole city dedicated to the study of religion, Homs. Um, in Iran, uh, they could have destroyed that city. They could have destroyed every government building in Iran, particularly in 1989. Iran was particularly weak. There's very little they could have done about it. Um, but instead, pff, instead, we did nothing. And, and I think today's event is a direct consequence of that. And it's, it's sad because not only is it sad because Solomon Rushdie has been attacked and, and might, be, might be killed. And my general assessment of Rushdie is he's basically a good guy and certainly doesn't deserve this and whose rights should have been protected. But more than that, 
it, it emboldens Islamic terrorism. I, we, you know, maybe it's been relatively quiet the last few years, but um, you know, the the uh, the Charlie Hebdo is not that long ago. Uh, it was 2015, so it's only seven years ago. Uh, you could see other events like that. You could see an event like this, the stabbing of Rushdie, emboldening more people, more nuts, uh, you know, Islamists, uh, Islamic fanatics to do this, to, to, to become more violent and to engage in more violence. Uh, the, the, the terrorist infrastructure has not gone away. There are plenty of them out there. Somebody here says on the chat says that uh, the perpetrator... Uh, is a Shiite Lebanese, which is which would not be surprising. Remember that uh, Shiite Lebanese are the allies of the Iranians. The Iranians are uh, big funders of uh, of uh, Shiite Islam in Lebanon. Uh, they are uh, supporters of Hezbollah. Hezbollah is the uh, Shiite terrorist group that is based in um, in Lebanon. Uh, Hezbollah are the, are the, is the terrorist group that actually uh, with Iranian support, funding, training, and everything else, they're the ones who executed the attack on the, on the Marines barracks in Beirut in, um, in 1983 that killed, um, I think it was the 244 uh, Marines. I think that's the right number. Um, so, it, it, you know, when we say it, it's not surprising that it would be somebody uh, from Lebanon, it would be interesting to see if he has links to Hezbollah. It would be interesting to see if there's kind of a chain of command if this is something that, that got approved from above or just a, a, an individual just uh, lashing out, well, I mean, an individual lashing out with dangling three and a half million dollars for his family probably um, it dangled out there by uh, the Iranian regime. Uh, so, you know, truly just, uh, you know, just horrific um, and, uh, and tragic and sad, just sad. Sad that this can still happen. Sad that it's not surprising that it happened. Sad that this will not change anything. You know what will change. You know what they'll say. You know what the conclusion of this will be. What's the conclusion going to be? What are they going to say? What is what is the 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 vast majority? Pretty much everybody is going to say is a lesson from the stabbing. What's what's the lesson? We shouldn't tolerate the Islamists. We shouldn't tolerate Iran. We shouldn't tolerate threats. What is the lesson? I mean, the lesson, I think it's, it's obvious that the lesson that will be drawn from this is we need more security. We need more security. We're not going to do anything about the people who actually are responsible for this. We're not going to do anything about the people behind this. We need more security. It's Solomon Rushdie's fault because he stopped taking security to talks. He should have been surrounded by five people. Um, and uh, it's it's our fault for not providing it with the right kind of security, right? We'll blame ourselves. And and of course, you know, people will still say, you know, he really shouldn't have written that satanic verses, and maybe should have stayed quiet since then. You know, when he was hiding, he was quiet, and maybe things were safer then, and just yeah. But more security and less offending, less offending Islam. That's, that's what the lessons learned uh, from this. And that is uh, truly horrific. It would be really interesting to see if, if Rushdie dies, and I hope he doesn't, but if he dies, it would be interesting to see, one, what is the American government's response going to be to the paying of the $3.5 million fatwa? What will we do when that money is actually paid? Would we then place the responsibility with the entity that's paying the money as, as a hit, right? They're paying for a hit. And second, what will they do if a Hezbollah connection or any kind of connection to Iranian intelligence or any kind of connection to, um, uh, to Iran or to, or to the Hezbollah is found? Yeah. It's also interesting to point out that over the last uh, few weeks, two other major opponents of the Iranian regime have been attacked and uh, assassination attempts have been uh, attempted on them. One is a woman whose name I don't remember right now, uh, who's been a very critic, a big critic of the Iranian regime. She's, a, she's somebody who, who uh, escaped Iran and, and is in the United States. And um, 
she survived an attack, uh, an attempted uh, attempted assassination on her. And then the other one is somebody you guys all know, um, and many of you hate because Donald Trump doesn't like him, uh, and that is John Bolton. Uh, I don't know if you read this story, but John Bolton, uh, about a week ago, um, the FBI announced that they had arrested an Iranian, an Iranian, uh, linked to the supposedly linked to the Iranian secret, uh, the Iranian uh, security services, um, arrested him for an attempt for for an attempt to assassinate John Bolton. So is this a new attempt by the Iranians? Is the Salman Rushdie part of this? Is there an, a push by the Iranians right now to uh, to stir things up in the United States to uh, get rid of their opponents? I think. Uh, he was going to, that's right, was he going to assassinate Mike Pompeo as well? Certainly John Bolton he was going to assassinate. And Bolton's, of course, a huge critic of Iran, has been very good on Iran over the years. Uh, John Bolton, one of the better, I think one of the better foreign policy thinkers uh, since 9-11. And um, there you go, right? A, a, a woman critical of Iran, John Bolton, and now Salman Rushdie. There really seems to be a pattern here coming out of Iran is Iran ready to be significantly more aggressive? Is Iran ready to ready to uh, take on the United States in a more meaningful sense? You know, this is the same time that Iran supposedly is negotiating a um, some kind of treaty with the United States uh, to lift the sanctions, so uh, and and to uh, to rescind their nuclear program. Is this going to change? You think the Biden administration's approach to the Iranians? Is this going to cause them to be more cautious in negotiating with them? Is this going to cause them to walk away from the negotiating table? I think I'd put money on the fact that no, that that's not the case. So Gary says there's a fatwa for 300,000 on Bolton and a million on Pompeo. All right, interesting. But but yes, the guy who, the guy who was going to kill them was arrested, so they caught him. Uh, it's too bad this guy wasn't arrested before he got a chance to to attack uh, Rushdie. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbrookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one of those uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and of course subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are ready subscribers and those of you who are ready supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.